God is going to see you through. God is going to see you through. Through the flood, through the fire, through your storms and through your trials, God is going to see you through. Boy, I'm so glad that you're here today. We, uh, you know, we just enjoy doing these programs. I really do. I thoroughly look forward to it and just uh, hope that you're tuning in. And, and, and most of all, though, I hope that you're getting some tips and some things like that in regards to finances, as well as some of the conversation that we have had about things that are, that are going on. Because you know what? As the song says, God is going to see us through. And that's the main thing that we have to know in our hearts, that God is going to see us through. Sometimes when we get in circumstances or situations and we just don't know how to handle them or what to do and all of a sudden it happens, you know what? God knows. He knew before it was going to take place. He knew what was going to happen. And he knows that he's going to bring his people through. So, you know, God definitely is going to see us through. But I want to talk a little bit today as well as give you some tips in regards to um, saving money and finances and so on. But I just want to talk to you a little bit today about the unexpected circumstances that do come up. There are unexpected circumstances that comes up in our life. You know, many, uh, many things that happen in our life, we weren't looking to see those things to happen. Just all of a sudden, you say to yourself, what happened? And because you just don't, you just don't know. And, you know, all of us have experienced one time or another unexpected circumstances. Sometimes we find ourselves, before we know it, we find ourselves in a financial situation because we haven't really made some wise decisions or made some wise choices in what we do. So therefore, sometimes these unexpected circumstances come up and we don't realize it. We, things come up, things break. That, that is unexpected. All of a sudden, I know a friend of mine has a beautiful truck and everything was going fine. All of that had a, has the warranty on the truck, but all of a sudden, the truck quits. They can't figure out what in the world is wrong with the truck. And it has held him up from doing the work that he needs to do. Now, that was an unexpected circumstance that arose in their life. Then all of a sudden, I, I heard one person say to me, I thought I had this money coming in because I banked on that money coming in so that I could take care of this that I bought over here. Don't ever bank on money coming in for sure from some other source other than whether you uh, made it or not in the sense of your employment. Don't bank on money just because somebody says it's going to come in. So those are unexpected circumstances. And little did we think that in 2020 that it was going to start this way. Little did we think. You know, a lot of us looked at 2020, oh my goodness, it's 2020. I wonder what is in store for us. See, I look to 2020 to be a, a memorable year, but uh, had no idea what was going to make it memorable. People will never forget 2020, just like they didn't forget 1918. They're not going to forget 2020. So how many of us have experienced all these unexpected circumstances that, that has arisen? And how many of us said, I just didn't see this coming? Many a times I've said that. And now we're saying, what, you know, what's going on in America now in regards to the economy? I think more people are 
concerned about the economy than they are concerned about the virus. I believe in maybe a lot of people's hearts, maybe most people's hearts, they feel, I think they're getting this under control. And the way that it has gotten under control is simply for the fact that you and I have stayed home like we should. We have worn our mask. We have worn our gloves. We have done the things that we know that have been suggested to us. And if you haven't, um, I still encourage you to get yourself a good mask, get yourself good gloves, and, you know, respond to some of the responsible things of watching after your own health. Always remember, nobody's going to watch your health except you. You're the one that's going to watch over your health. Even whenever you go to the doctor's office, don't hide anything from the doctor. Don't tell him everything is okay, but maybe you may have this ache or you may have this pain or you may have constant headaches all the time. Don't hold things back from your doctor. And so it's very important that we listen to what they're telling us. But I, but I think by and large, most people are observing these things. I see more and more as I go out into the store, I see people with their mask on, people with their gloves on, and it's become common. But I do believe because we have complied with some of these suggestions that have been made to help us, I do believe that this has brought it to a level. Now we know that a lot of the new cases that have come up is simply because of some of the nursing homes. So we know that the cases that have come up recently have been predominantly because of this rash of, of illnesses because of the virus. But I do believe it within my heart that we are beginning to get a handle on it. I do believe that as we go into the summer that uh, because we're going into the heat. And yesterday I was listening to a gentleman uh, that uh, the president had uh, brought up to the podium and he said he said people should stay outside more he said as the heat progresses as we get into the summer we're going to find that this virus is killed by heat by heat and uh, within my heart I've always believed that that whenever, if you stay outside, if you enjoy the outside and go outside into the weather, um, that I think that you're, even though it's hot out there and you say, I'm going to sweat, I think it's the best place to be. So I really see that this virus is going to get under control exactly when, I have no idea. But I do know this, that I feel within my heart that uh, we're approaching that. So I think more people are interested in now, the next phase of concern is getting this economy back into the workings again. And I believe that there's a lot of good ideas out there in regards to getting the economy started back up, but doing it with precaution. And I think not only precaution of the business owners, but precaution of us, we be very cautious about where we go. If we go into a restaurant, which probably a lot of us can't wait to get into a restaurant again and get waited on and have somebody cook our food and all of that good stuff. But, you know, we still have to be uh, cautious about what we do and where we go and make sure that there's certain rules and regulations that the, um, that the businesses have decided that they're going to make. So I think that this is one way that the economy is going to open again. Uh, as you look at the stock market, the stock market is leveling out, which is a good thing. Some of you may have investments in the stock market, made a decision, I'm not even going to look at it because I don't want to see how much money I've lost or whatever. 
But I do believe, I keep up with the stock market every single day. I watch the stock market every day. And I begin to see, uh, I'm seeing a nice leveling in regards to, in regards to the stock market. So um, I believe that uh, more people are concerned about the economy and how are we going to get the economy back on its feet? And uh, so, you know, right now, I, I think that a lot of people are at the point that uh, have been laid off, that if they had any savings, they're, if they're beginning to run out of their money if they already haven't. And they're getting kind of wondering what's going on because the unemployment has been kind of stymied a little bit uh, because of the overwhelming amount of applications that have been made. It's just an overwhelming amount. And I do believe they're trying to do everything that they can do, but that doesn't help you. But let me say this, for those that are out here, we at Faith Outreach Center are open to you. If there is any needs that you have, Please call the office. Please call us and let us know what your needs are. You know, we want to take care of you. We want to watch over you. We feel that that is part of the mandate that God has placed upon our heart, is to take care of God's people. And I believe that that's the way God uses it. He uses people to help other people. God lays upon your heart to do these things different things for others. I see such a transformation in people today desiring to help one another. Uh, our, we have a group here that makes phone calls to our parishioners to make sure that they're taken care of and watched over and make sure that they don't have any needs. And the reports back that I am getting from these uh, ladies that, that are doing this are saying, you know, it's so wonderful to see how this one is contacting this one and how that one is contacting that. And there is that feeling and that coming together of camaraderie. And I, and I, just, uh, I just so appreciate it in my heart that I see that people are coming together, you know? But let me say this to, to those that are unemployment and out of work. You're going to have to reinvent yourself. Well, what do you mean by that, reinvent myself? Well, you've got to get your entrepreneurship hat on. You've got to figure out, okay, what is it that I could do? Maybe I'm not going to make the kind of money that I made at my job, but that's immaterial. You know what's more important? keeping food on the table for your family, getting your rent paid or getting your mortgage paid or your electric bill. That's the most important. You're in survival ship now. We're, we're all in a survival mode, those that are out of work. And so you have to sort of reinvent yourself until the jobs that you've been accustomed to working at open back up again. So what, what, what do I think that you can do? I'm glad that you asked me that. Now, there are plenty of jobs open, believe it or not. There are jobs open. It may not be the kind of job that you want, but for the time being, temporarily, until your job gets open again, you, uh, you need to put some money into the household. So there's jobs available on Amazon. There's jobs available at Publix, Winn-Dixie. Uh, there's a, a, just a bunch of jobs out there. But let me tell you what you do. You go to Google Jobs Available in Tampa Bay Area. Google Jobs Available in Tampa Bay Area. And as I said, it may not be uh, the kind of pay that you're accustomed to, but... Uh, it will put food on the table. Uh, I was watching the the, uh, the news this morning, and there was this young man. He he has a bicycle. So what does he do? He said he had to get food on his table. So what he does 
is that he delivers groceries to people's houses. And as a matter of fact, my grandson does the same identical thing right now because he knows he has to put food on the table. And so he's making good money delivering groceries because people can order them and, and uh, he goes and picks them up in the store, delivers them, and it's all taken care of. So that's one way. He sort of reinvented himself from his profession because he knew that he had to provide for his family. And, you know, that's, that's extremely important. We have to provide for our families. So you may have some other ways, some other things that you have done to sort of reinvent yourself for a period of time. And so I would like to know what those other things are or where you may see that a job is available so that I can share it with what for those people that are watching this program because I'd like to be able to pass that on and pass that news on to them and to let them know you know exactly where a job is so that they can go out and get it but you know I, I've had the question posed to me where is God in all of this where is God in all of this and you know I'm sorry to say, but sometimes I think people think that uh, God is a Bales bondman. Bales bondman, yeah. In other words, if we get ourselves in trouble, he's there to bail us out every time. Um, I don't look at God that way. Whenever things happen in my life, I kind of look back to me and I say, hmm. Is there something that I'm doing or is there something I'm not doing that uh, some things have kind of, you know, maybe gone awry in my life? But let me say something about God. First of all, God has never moved. He's never moved. He's exactly where he is. If you'll remember, he says in his word, he'll never leave us or forsake us, that he's with us always. And he's talking to his people. He's talking to his people, the people of God. And he said he would never, never leave us, and he would never forsake us. And I believe that. I believe that with all of my heart. I believe that God as much is with me now as he was before all of this took place. Some people look at God, and I'll put it this way, and please understand, like he's a sugar daddy. No, God's not a sugar daddy. God is always there to watch after us, to take care of us, and to teach us things. Now, do I believe that God created this virus? Of course not. God doesn't do bad things. Only the enemy instigates bad things. But God will take advantage of something to bring people back into perspective again of thinking. See, I've seen such a change in people's thinking since all of this took place. I find people are talking to other people like they never have before. They're calling other people. How are you? How, how's things going? They are uh, even taking groceries to people that they think may need them. You know, just voluntarily doing acts of kindness. And I have seen acts of kindness just, just overtake some of the people in our congregation. I, I mean, I am so proud of our congregation because they have really gone into the point of taking care of each other, taking care of themselves, and... Um, taking care of the ones that, that are around them. So I think that <clears throat> as we look at this, God did not move, but God will use it to bring people back into the proper perspective of what is important, what is first. I think it may, has made all of us put our priorities back in a much better perspective 
than what they were. I think that uh, this situation, um, I think that this situation has created a change in people and a change in their heart. So, as I said, I believe that God is using this to bring people back into the proper perspective of where they are and what is really important, what's really important. And I want us to look at Psalms. Look at the book of Psalms. Psalms chapter 1. I'd like you to get your Bible and look at this. Because it says in, in uh, chapter 1, looking at verse 1, and we're going to read verse 1 through 3, it says, How blessed is the man who does not walk in the counsel of the wicked, nor stand in the path of the sinners. Well, what does that mean, stand in the path of the sinners? In other words, standing in the same way that they are. You know, by making some compromise, I'm sorry to say, but I, I think that some Christians today have compromised some of their rules that they have put up for their own selves, that they've compromised it because the television and the media is so bombarded with, if it, you know, if it feels good, go ahead and do it. It doesn't make any difference. I do not find, unless you go on Christian television, very, very few people speak about God in this situation or speak about God, period, other than maybe using his name in vain or just making jokes and fun of God. That, that is walking in the ways of the wicked and sitting there and laughing at making fun of God. Now, those are some of the things that I believe that says, How blessed is the man who doesn't walk in the counsel of the wicked, nor stand in the path of the sinners, nor sit in the seat of the scoffers. The scoffers. We have scoffers today that are scoffing God, scoffing his ways. You know, you know years ago, there was a movement that came out. God was dead. Well, God's not dead. He's real. He's alive. He's watching after you. He's watching after me. And he's going to make sure that no weapon formed against you is going to prosper. Understand that. There will be weapons that form against us simply for the fact that the enemy is going to try to get you and move you in any way that he possibly can. But no weapon formed against you is going to prosper. That doesn't that means that it that these weapons are not going to overtake you because God is watching after you. Now, but his delight is in the law of the Lord. And in his law he meditates day and night. He will be like a tree firmly planted by streams of water. That living water. You are a plant planted by the streams of living water. Jesus is our living water. That, that, he's our living water. And we're planted by him. And as I said, there's no weapon formed against you or me or anybody else that's walking in the ways of God that will prosper. Things will come against us. But he says he will be like a tree firmly planted by streams of water, which yields its fruit in its season, and its leaves does not wither, and in whatever he does, he will prosper. You see, when we are sitting by the rivers of living water, when we are sitting he will be the tree that is planted by the streams of living water. I want to give you a little story about a tree, about a tree. And this tree 
was a little tree and it was planted and it grew to be this great big strong tree, very strong. And it began to get branches on it. And the branches began to go this way and this way and this way and this way. See, when you and I first got saved, we were planted by that. We were planted in that tree. And we became these branches that came off of that tree. But have you ever really seen branches that have kind of gone astray over this way and gone this way and haven't stayed firm living by that tree of living water? Kind of strayed away from that, that tree. And you know what happens? Is that those are the things that we get involved in that we know as Christians we shouldn't. Watching maybe shows we shouldn't, go to movies we shouldn't do. Maybe uh, doing some of the things that we know that's totally opposed to God. Now, we belong to God. So if I belong to God, that means that he's going to have to prune me every so often. And you know what? I firmly believe right now a lot of us are in the pruning stage. I think of a lot of us have been pruned. And you know what happens? When we get pruned, we begin to go get our perspective right to go back to that tree that's planted by that living water, which is Jesus Christ. And so I believe that's where you and I are right now, that we are planted, and that's where we need to stay. Because when the pruning comes into our life, we don't like it. Pruning makes us uncomfortable. And I can just imagine, because I know that the way that my strength is, is that I can go astray, I can get so involved in all sorts of different things that I lose perspective about the tree that I'm attached to. And all of a sudden I find, hmm, I'm, gonna, I, I'm getting pruned. Why? Because I belong to God. You may be getting pruned, and that's why you belong to God. You know that you belong to God whenever pruning comes in our life. Well, is this coronavirus a pruning aspect? No, no, I'm not saying that. All I'm saying is this, is that God is using us to bring us back into perspective. Now, it is, I, I say that it's a weapon, but in his word, he says no weapon formed against us will prosper. So he's going to take this period of time right now and bring us back into perspective, which means he's pruning us, and bring us back into perspective of who he is and what is really important in our life. Let me say this. Take self-examination and say, what is really important in my life. God needs to be first in everything we do. We need to consult him. We need to talk to him. We need to take in what we need from him and he will lead and guide us in the right direction. All right, uh, just, re just remember what I said. We are like that tree planted by the living water. Okay? And we're not gonna we're not gonna be moved. You and I are not going to be moved. But I want to talk to us a little bit about how we spend our money. How do we spend our money? When I go uh, when I look at spending money, 
I think in regards to my wants, my needs, my desires, uh, what is it that I would like to have, and you know, whenever you're you first get married and you early on in life, you have a lot of dreams and visions about what you'd like to accomplish in life. In other words, I'd like to have a nice home. Maybe I want uh, two or three kids. Maybe sometimes you get less kids. Maybe sometimes you get more kids than that. But, uh, you know, you begin to have dreams and you begin to have visions in regards to, to your life and what you think in your mind and what you envision in your mind, what your life is going to be like. And sometimes those things that we were talking about, um, unexpected circumstances arise. And there are unexpected circumstances that arises in our life all the time. But, you know, you, you begin to think about that. But as I said, a lot of people don't really think about their finances and they don't have a, a, a really a good perspective on their finances unless they have been taught. Uh, whenever we do marriage counseling here, we take them through, we take the, the counselees through a whole and complete uh, financial counseling because one of the biggest problems in marriage is finances. That's one of the biggest problems because the perspective of how you look at it, look at finances, and the perspective of how your husband looks at finances or your wife looks at finances may be totally different. And uh, as a matter of fact, even as far as children, we were, I was in counseling here with a couple that was about to get married, and uh, I talked to them about uh, having children. And one wanted children, the other one didn't want children. My goodness, that's a big thing. And I, I told them, I said, you two, before you get married, you had better go back and uh, come up with, uh, you know, a perspective of what you're going to do. Because if you get into this marriage and she thinks that she wants to have children and you don't want to have children, then that's going to create a problem. And so before you get married, it's best to get that straightened out. Well, the same thing with finances. You know, um, I feel that one of the most important uh, aspects of somebody getting married is to talk about money. And yet, a lot of young people don't even talk about money. Uh, today's thinking um, of young people are entirely different than what it was whenever I got married, or even probably when you got married out there, that they feel what's mine is mine, and what's yours is yours, and and uh, we don't put anything together, we keep our own money, and so on like that. Well, if that's the way they want to work it, that's okay. But uh, whenever you get joined together, you become one flesh. So that's kind of my perspective on the thing. But young people don't talk about money, but I remember even as I was, uh, in, you know, as I was a young person about to get married, a lot of the people around me didn't talk about money. But I praise God that my mother raised me to really have a respect for money. Respect. Now just hold that word and, you know, and think about it. Respect for money. And so my mother taught me to have respect for money and to have understanding about it and most of all have discipline about money. So I think that it's very important that this subject that we're talking about, and basically we're talking about financial freedom. Do we really want financial freedom? And I, and I think that that's something that we all had to come to a conclusion of and come to the conclusion even now, do I really want financial freedom or do I just, you know, have I been trained that I'll always be in debt? Praise God, you know, 
I, I don't, I wasn't trained that way to always be in debt. The way I was trained uh, was to stay out of debt. And what I can say to you today is stay out of debt. And the first thing that you do is, first of all, you have to discipline. You have to be disciplined with your money. And how can I be disciplined with my money? Well, you can be disciplined with your spending. Think before you spend. And another thing that you have to have respect for money. Respect that money that, you, that's your hard earned money. You work 40 hours a week, or maybe some of you out there work more hours than 40 hours a week. And you put in a hard day's work for that. And just to spend it foolishly, or just spending it on wants more than needs. And I find that in, in doing uh, financial counseling with people, I find that they put more money out on their wants than they do their needs. And when their needs come, they're crying the blues because they haven't got their mortgage payment or they haven't got their electric payment or whatever the case may be. Now, whenever I first started out, I started out with what you call the envelope method. Maybe some of you had the envelope method or have the envelope method even to this day. And I don't say anything about it. I, I think it's, it's great. But most of the time, um, a lot of people, not today, but uh, most of the time, say 25 years ago, people dealt in cash. So whenever I first, when we first started out and got married, I had little envelopes. This was for the electric, this was for the mortgage, this was for the thing, and all these little envelopes. And each week, I would put the money into the envelopes, and when it came time to pay the mortgage payment, the electric payment, the water payment, whatever, then I had the money in there to do that. But what was more important was that I put the money in the little envelopes so that I was secure to have that money at the end of the month to be able to pay those bills and um, make sure that those were done. And then whatever was left over, that was what I could use just for whatever incidentals or the, the groceries or for gas or whatever needed to be done. But I would live on what was left, but my bills came first. I do not find that mentality today, and that's one of the reasons why people are up to their ears in debt or even having to go to bankruptcy and go through all of these financial things because they did not discipline themselves and did not respect that money at all and now here they are, they're in hot water with, all, with, with owing all this money. So, you know, we have to come to the mentality of, do we really want to be out of debt? And that's a question that you really have to ask yourself. Do I really want to be out of debt? Do I really want to function in my life? however old you are or however young you are. If you are in your 20s and your 30s and you are listening to this program, please take my advice. Begin now. Begin with the budget. Begin budgeting your money. You will be surprised if for one month, if for just one month, if you would write down every single penny and where it went to, you would be shocked and you would be surprised to find out that you have spent so much money foolishly and now it's gone and now when it comes time to pay your bills, you haven't got the money to pay your bills. So you have to come to the mentality of realizing, do I really want to be out of debt. 
I pray that all of you out there are saying a big yes. I want to be out of debt. I would, I would love to know how I can get out of debt. Well, you're not going to get out of debt as fast as you got into it. That's number one. You're not going to get out of it as fast. But with consistency and steadily, steadily, steadily putting the money and putting it to the right places, you are going to find that you are going to be totally and completely financially free. Now I'm going to ask you a few questions. Um, <clears throat> I have a chapter in my book and it's called Why Am I in Debt? And uh, what it really is stating here is that majority of Americans are in debt one way or another. But I mean it's no condemnation on it, it's just you know, it's just a pure fact that people are in debt, and they're in debt in debt traps. Credit cards, to me, are debt traps because it is so easy, so easy to pull out that little piece of plastic and plunk it down. Now, if we didn't have that little piece of plastic and we had to pay by cash, do you know what? Less people would be in debt today simply because they don't want to part with their cash. Some people don't even carry cash. I believe in carrying cash and I do believe in carrying the card. It's not the card that is the problem. The card doesn't jump out of your wallet and go and say, oh, I want to go spend something. No, your card doesn't do that. We pull the card out and then we place it down. So what I'm looking at is that first of all the question is, do I really want do I really want to be out of debt? And if I really want to be out of debt systematically, what can I do? Number one, you can discipline. Just exactly like I said, you can discipline. And you know, and and this is what you can do about your finances to get a handle on it. So let's just take a look at how, how do we really spend our money? How do we spend our money? Now, these, these are four areas of spending habits. Number one, do we uh, spend our money and by just using cash? Number two, do we just write out checks? Number three is do we do it with a credit card or a debit or an ATM? How do we actually spend our money? Now, when I use my credit card, and I, I'm, not, I'm not opposed to credit cards, but I say only have one credit card just one and let the card do the work for you you don't work for the card the card works for you so uh, when I use my credit card this is the question I'm posing to you I never charge more than I can pay in full each month I make only the minimum payment each month now these are these are four different ways that people handle their money I make only the minimum payment each month. Next is, I keep my card charged up to the limit. Number four, I sometimes borrow on one card to pay another. Now, these are the four areas of the spending habits of people today. This is how they spend their money. They, you, if they use a card, they pay it off at the end of the month. They never charge any more money than what they know that they can handle. Now, out of those four, which category fits you? I pay it off at the end of the month. I make the minimum payment. I charge my card to the limit. And then I sometimes borrow one card to pay another card. 
Now, three of those are sad commentaries. Number one, the first one I said, I never charge more than I can pay in full each month. That's the way to handle a credit card. Simply for the fact, simply for the fact that it will work for you and you don't work for that card. Now, this is, now we're talking about spending habits. Get that in your mind. We're talking about spending habits. Now, I buy things I can't really afford. Wow. These are spending habits of people today. I buy things I can't really afford. Now, number one, when I see a good sale, that's when I buy it. To cheer myself up. Do you know a lot of people spend, go out and go shopping just because they're upset with something, they're depressed about something, whatever, and they think that uh, going out and shopping and spending money is going to be a big fix. Well, that's great until the end of the month, whenever they got to pay it. Now, the next thing is to keep up with family and friends. Do you know some people stay in debt so that they can keep, uh, keep a face? I call it keeping a face with their family and their friends. Well, if you got it, I'm going to have it too. That's ridiculous. That's ridiculous. Number four, I don't buy things I can't afford. Hmm, my goodness. Now, which category do you fit into? I buy things, uh, yeah, I buy things that I can't really afford. When I see a good sale, whether I can afford it or not, if I see a good sale, do I buy it? Next thing is, do you spend money to cheer yourself up? Do you do it just to keep up with the, with the Joneses, as they say? Keep up with the Joneses. Do you do it to keep up with family and friends? Or do you not buy unless you know good and well that you can afford it? Now, which one of those do you think is the most sensible way of handling your money? Hmm. I don't buy things I can't afford. Wow. That's the way that you will have financial freedom, is simply by going by that one little thing. I don't buy things I can't afford. One day, when you have financial freedom and you have more money and liberty, then you see you can maybe buy a good sale simply for the fact that you can afford it. But you can't afford it as long as you stay deep into debt. You just get deeper and deeper and deeper. And before you know it, you're covered up, totally and completely covered up. Now, let me ask you another question. What do you do when you say to yourself, I want something? Okay, do you not worry? I don't worry how I pay for it. In other words, it doesn't make any difference. I want it, so I'm going to get it and I'm not going to worry about how I pay for it. Or, or do I try to talk myself out of it? Have any of you tried to talk yourself out of buying something? I have a standing rule, depending on, and we have a standing rule. My husband and I have a standing rule in the house. If we want something that costs more than $300, $300. If we buy something or we want something that's more than $300, then we sit down and we discuss it. We talk about it. We talk about the pros and cons of it. Do we really need it? Is it just a want or a whim on our side? Can we really afford it? Now, if it's something that we can really afford. That's really the bottom of the line, is can we really afford it? And if Pastor and I can really afford it, 
whatever it is, we go ahead and we buy it because we know that it isn't going to hurt us or it isn't going to uh, prohibit us from paying all the rest of our bills, paying our electric bill or our water bill. You know, it, it's not going to affect us. So we carefully talk about it and we can carefully consider, you know, how is it that I can do this? Now, I, I can honestly say to you, and I'll be very, very transparent, my husband and I do not buy anything that's very large without saving for it first so that we can then pay cash for it. That's how we do it. Um, we had saved to get me a, another car, not a new car, I'm not into new cars, but buy another car. So we had saved the money, we had the money in the bank for the car, and we shopped, he shopped, and he looked around, and we finally found the car that uh, we felt that we wanted to buy. It was over in Melbourne, so we took a trip, went over to Melbourne, saw the car that we wanted, and I have that car to today. But we paid cash for it, because we had saved the money in order to pay cash for a car. So it wasn't as if, you know, if I wanted a new car or wanted another car, not a new one, but another car, then and just went on ahead and went into debt for it, that would be one thing, but we didn't do that. That's not our philosophy. And not that I'm trying to impose our philosophy on you, but I'm simply saying that I feel within my heart, even as a financial counselor, that it's better to save for what you're going to purchase. Now, you say, well, what do you do about it whenever your refrigerator breaks down and you've got to buy a new refrigerator because it's so old and so on down the line like that? That's a necessity. But, but, what you should have been doing is putting away a certain amount of money for an emergency fund so that when that time comes, and it will come, it absolutely will come in all of our lives, we will very definitely have something that breaks down. Mm -hmm. uh, something that we have to purchase because maybe it's so old or whatever the case may be. And so, but let's save for that. Let's have an emergency fund. Let's put the money in an emergency fund and just leave it there. Don't touch it. Act as if you don't even have that money until that emergency comes about. And when it does, it doesn't disrupt your, your bills because some people have to then, if they don't have that emergency fund, what they have to do is that they have to take their bill money and then go and buy another refrigerator. Uh, maybe they try to get by and buy a cheap one and it runs for about three months or whatever. I don't advise that either. I advise trying to get yourself a decent refrigerator and maybe a brand new one if you can and getting a warranty with it on top of it. So I'm, I'm into warranties because I believe that they do pay off. And I can attest to my own testimony about things about warranties. So, but anyway, you, uh, you know, you, you have to look at those kind of things. Now, <clears throat> next thing is when it comes to budgeting. Now we talked about budgeting in the last program and uh, we touched on it a little bit, but how important that it is for you to have a budget. And in that budget, you put your emergency fund for that time that things will come. And we know that they will come. So when it comes to a budget, number one, I don't have a budget. I have a budget, but what I'm saying is that when I'm asking the question, I'm asking the question to you, when it comes to budgeting, do you have a budget? Number two, 
I often spend money I have set aside for other things on items I don't really need. Could be you may have an emergency fund, but then you tap into it for things that you don't really need. Then you've done an injustice to yourself because if you tap into that money <clears throat> that you have put away for that emergency, and if you tap into that, then you don't have it when that emergency happens. Number three, I do have a savings account and a retirement plan. Praise God that you, for someone that has a savings account and a retirement plan. So with that, you know, <clears throat> that's important. Um, now, number three here is I strictly follow my sp spending plan. That's the way you should conduct your, your life with your budgeting. If you have a budget, stick to your budget. Stick to your plan. Whatever that plan is, stick to it. One more. <clears throat> when it comes to savings, these are the questions I ask you when it comes to savings. And you may tell me I don't have a savings account or a plan. you got to have a plan. got to have a plan for your money. Or two... I do have a savings account, but no retirement plan. You should have a retirement plan. If the company that you work for does not provide a retirement plan, then you can have one yourself by getting an IRA. It's called an IRA retirement plan. And it's even deductible on your tax return. So, or number three, I do have a savings account and I do have a retirement plan. So, these are some of the spending habits that people have. These are, these are some of the spending habits that people have. And <clears throat> I say to you, be very disciplined about your money. Begin now. If you truly want to have financial freedom, sleep good at night and not worried about money, then you need to develop yourself a good budgeting plan. Really sit down. Analyze your finances. Analyze your finances. See the areas that you can cut out. There's so many areas probably that we can cut out of our life that is our desires and our wants versus what our needs are. So these are just a, a, a few tips, and we'll be talking about some of the other areas and some of the other things. But just remember this, that God is watching over you. God is taking care of you. God loves you more than you'll ever know or you'll ever experience. So I just want to I just wanted to share that with you today a little bit and also invite you to join us on video stream on Sunday at 1045 for our service. I believe the Sunday school classes are on at nine o'clock in the morning. And so we just want you to know that we love you. If you need anything, be sure and call us at the office. God bless you, and always remember, God is going to see you through. Oh, God is going to see you through. Oh, God is going to see you through somehow, some way. Oh, God is going to see you through.